You don't know these people, you will by the end of this uh, short conversation. Maybe you know my name, what is it? Okay, great. Are, are you all wearing badges? You all wearing badges? Uh, I have a name, you all have names, right? Call out your names. Loudly, like you're proud of them. Like they protect you, because they do. Your names protect you, your badges protect you. Think about all the things that you have about you, that are on you, that are connected to you, that make sure that you're connected to someone, so that you are never in a situation where you find yourself thrown away, where no one will find you, where no one will care that you didn't show up somewhere, or care that you didn't call home, or won't have a place to be found. Think about all the things that keep you from being anonymous and vulnerable and thrown away and forgotten. Now think about all those things being ripped away from you right now, and there you are naked, not in the literal sense, but naked in the sense that you have no standing in the world. No one cares about you. No one will find you. Anyone can hurt you. Anyone can have power over you. It's the story we're going to tell about women in Canada. It's not certainly the only group that we could tell this story about, but it's the story that we choose for today. First of all, I'm very proud to be here for the women in my life, my mother Nancy, my wife Allison, and my three daughters Zoe, Olivia, and Regan. Uh, this is the most important forum for exploring and looking down into the future of uh, women's issues in the world. And I, as a man, am very proud to be here. Let's begin our conversation. <laughs> Michelle, thank you so much for holding those. You're welcome. I had to do a little bit of showbiz there, right? <laughs> right. Um, I'm going to introduce all of you, but I want to um, start by what's your connection to the things that I've just said and the video that we saw? Uh, my daughter, Stephanie Lane, was uh, 20 years old when she was murdered by Robert Picton, who is uh, Canada's most prolific serial killer. Right, and we'll hear more about Robert in a moment, but what was it about your daughter that made her vulnerable to a predator like that? What was it about her that made her part of the shame that was discussed in the video? My daughter was a young indigenous woman. Uh, my daughter had uh, just um, got into uh, uh, the life of drugs and, uh, and then because of that had turned to uh, survival sex trade. 
Michelle is a human example of someone who's connected to one of the people who are six times more likely to be victims of homicides. More than a third live in poverty. More than one in four indigenous Canadian women report having been a victim of domestic violence. The problem has gotten the attention of the United Nations. Last year, the Human Rights Committee slammed Canada's record on missing and murdered indigenous women. Melina, what is your story? And uh, why are you connected with those facts that I've just described? My sister Bella was found dead um, two years and not just under nine months ago. Um, it was probably one of the worst phone calls I've ever received in my life. She had just actually got graduated from college. She had left our community in the province of Alberta to move to Toronto to go to fashion school and um, just graduated. And um, three months later, she was found dead and her case is still unsolved and listed as suspicious. And she was not in the sex trade. She was not. She was not at all. And, and so that's, you know, I think we have to be careful around like, the stereotypes sometimes that are that are put out there in the in mainstream media because you know a lot of these women weren't in the sex trade as well and they had their but they're also prone to violence because indigenous women's lives are undervalued in Canada and as well as here in, in America so that's a part of you know this conversation of seeing how many indigenous women are affected by violence whether it be from a perpetrator that they didn't know or whether it was from somebody they did know or Etc. But it's a it's a major issue, and you know the fact that indigenous are indigenous women are five to six times more likely to die die a violent death. I think is why now there's a national inquiry in Canada regarding how, this issue. How can it be the case? And tell me something about a little bit about the history. And of course, we have our shameful history in the United States regarding indigenous people that uh, we could talk about endlessly. Here we could have conferences about it, but. Uh, uh, why would it be the case that an indigenous woman, even one whose academic and educational achievement was superior and part of the mainstream, be instantly categorized and sort of tagged from the time she might have been a teenager or even earlier? Mm -hmm. Well, the fact that we, the issues that in Canada are pervasive and there's a lot of racism and there's a lot of stereotyping and a lot of colonial policies that have been implemented on our community that has really impacted how non-Indigenous people see our communities. And that's been really detrimental between the relationships between Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people across the Americas and here in the US and Canada. And so my sister, you know, when she was found dead, she was now labeled as an Indigenous woman, not, not necessarily a college graduate. And the police at that point were even saying, oh, she was on drugs. And we're like, our family was like, no, actually, she was not a drug user. She was a college graduate. And they kept saying this until a year and a half later when our family finally pushed them to get a full tox and there was no drugs found in her system. Can you tell me about that conversation? Who was it that you spoke with who presumed? The, the head detective for under um, the Criminal Investigations Bureau and Division 14 in Toronto Police Services. And uh, came right up to you and said what? He actually emailed our lawyer this and said that, you know, we think Bella was on drugs and our lawyer said, no, the, the family's repeatedly knows her and she's, they've said, no, she's, a, she's been in college, that's been her mainstay. She's actually applied to go to the UK to finish like an after degree. She was not a drug user, so stop insinuating that she was on drugs. And on, so on what basis did he issue. think she was on drugs? Did yeah. he give you any evidence? On what no, then, then we disproved them. We actually went to the coroner's office and asked to have a full tox, even though the case was listed as suspicious. They've never did a full tox, toxicology. And then, you know, then when it came back almost two years later that she was not on drugs, we said, thank you so much because we already knew this. But how, how angry does it make you to have to spend two years discovering something that you already know about your sister who you love who's been killed by someone through no fault of her own and at, in death is being accused of continuing to be a criminal. And I think that's the issue of the victim blaming of women, you know, women that are raped, women that are assaulted. There's this kind of, you know, imposition back onto the victim of this victim blaming. And that's what we're seeing in the deaths of all of these 4,000 indigenous women is if it's not the perpetrators that are targeting these vulnerable women, it's actually somehow must have had something to do with her lifestyle. It must have been having to do with what she did, um, as opposed to thinking actually this is a systemic issue across this nation that needs to be addressed from the root. All right, to both of you, Michelle and Melina, I, t I talked out there, you know, in my dramatic way about this idea that you lose all those connections that protect you, your name, your reputation, your, 
your, um, you know, someone recognizes you, you got a cell phone, whatever it is, all these tags that, that are going to protect you if, if you come to harm. Do you know what it feels like to be in a community, to be a member of a group that can be that naked, can be that vulnerable? Yeah. What's yeah, it like? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I grew up in Vancouver. I was born and raised in Vancouver. Uh, though I'm indigenous, I didn't have any culture. And I grew up thinking that people just didn't like me. And it wasn't into, until I was in my 40s that I realized that people didn't, because I was indigenous, I was treated different in lineups. I was treated different. But I didn't realize that when I was a child or in my early, early adulthood. I, did, I realized it in, in later years. You it wasn't until your 40s yeah. that you thought that it was just that people didn't like yeah. you? Yeah, well, hey, yeah. Hey, we, we like yeah. you. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. And she doesn't look like she's too out of her 40s either, does she? <laughs> no. Not a day over 40. Well, I have what a 20-year-old grandson, so I'm a little over 40. All right, I, all right. Yeah. What does that feel like in your... For me, my, one of my first memories is actually racism, being called a dirty Indian at the age of four. So, I mean, that's... it's pretty pervasive, especially in the north and the communities that we come from in the north. I'm from northern Alberta. It's like little Texas. And so um, it, there's definitely a lot of racism that's so pervasive in our communities. So there's a lot of separation between indigenous and non-indigenous communities. And even growing up, it was, a, it was a shameful thing to be indigenous, to be Cree, to be proud of who I was as an indigenous person. You know, my dad was, you know, a language speaker. He was grew up in like off the, off the, bu in the bush, as we call it. You know, he was, are we, I come from a very traditional family that my grandparents didn't even speak English. They only spoke Cree. They were that, they're indigenous to that land, and that's something that I'm very proud of. But the mainstream society made me feel like you're, you're worthless. You do not, you know, you shouldn't have a voice. You shouldn't speak out. You shouldn't do the things that you're doing because you're, you're, you're a shit disturber. You're like making, you're making too much noise. You need to be silent. And I think on this issue, we can't be. All right, so, so here's a hard one. Um, when you discovered that your sister had been killed. It, it might not have been a shock then, right? That my sister was killed? Right. Oh, it was a massive shock. But when the circumstances became clear that she had basically been caught in this net that you were familiar with of what it means to be Cree in Canada. Mm -hmm. Well. I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing because for me, I had been a part of like the massive marches where thousands of people come out across, you know, across many cities across Canada um, and had been doing that for like the past decade. But I, because I think I was so naive to think that it would happen to our family and happen to my sister, that I think I just, it was a shock. It was a shock because I was like, this is my baby sister. This is somebody who is so full of life and, you know, was so driven and so passionate. And, you know, like anyone in this room, you know, she was, she was a really hard worker. She was always making jokes. She loved life. She was looking forward to life, you know, and her coming to Toronto was a part of her fulfilling her dreams. So for me, it was, it, for our family, it was a shock, you know, because our family is, tries really hard, like both of our parents, like they have their master's degrees, I have my master's, like we're like trying really hard to be the people you don't, you that don't we want to be. You have to pass a test. But you know, be a like, human but being. exactly. You don't have, it's, no, it's you true. don't have to get good grades to be a human being. You don't. You're allowed to live. But sometimes in this society, that's what they tell you, but yeah. Wow. Canada's shame is what they put up there on the uh, screen. How do you feel about that, Minister? Carolyn? It's the truth. Uh, and that without the truth, we will never fix this problem. We will never get to a reconciliation with the fact that, that there were people who were here first, and that when the settlers arrived, they thought their life was superior, and, and that their lives were worth more. And we are working very hard to change that, and it is a... Uh, I think it's been well over a decade where amazing people uh, that have been fighting this fight from the Native Women's Association that have taught me so much about what their experience has been and, uh, and with their help we're going to fix this. We're going to actually have to deal not only with this, the stories that we've heard from the stereotypes to the non-stereotypes, we've got to deal with the issues around poverty and violence and education but the racism and sexism that, that means that 
when somebody who happens to be indigenous goes missing or is murdered, that that doesn't receive the same treatment as a non-indigenous person. And so you end up with people who've been told that it was an overdose or it was a suicide or an accident. And I think when, as we've gone coast to coast to coast, those are the stories that bother us and, and I think bother the police. That The file's empty because uh, this person was, it wasn't really, uh, it was just an assumption um, that this death or missing person was inevitable. So this is your, this is your responsibility as uh, minister, describe your, I mean, you've been appointed by uh, Prime Minister Trudeau um, in a position that gives you a very special responsibility to look at those empty files. Carolyn Bennett is your name. Um, what's your background? I'm a family doctor um, that uh, delivered babies for 25 years and uh, then uh, ran for public office. And so in, in the Parliament of Canada, the Government of Canada, I, 10 years ago was the Minister of State for Public Health where we began to look at some of the issues around social determinants, poverty, violence. Uh, but uh, I am truly honored that the Prime Minister has asked me to do this job. It's been a job that uh, has been a labor of love for, from the beginning, and I now get to do something about it. Um, with the support of the Prime Minister, who's asked the Minister of Justice, the Minister of Status of Women, the whole of our government is going to have to fix this. We know it's not going to be overnight, but we will do, launch a national public inquiry to get to these root causes. And we're going to put in place some of the things that we can do right now that the families have been talking about for a very long time. And it's time that we get on with it. What are, what are you doing? Tell us this specifically, and yes, indeed. Do you go and look at specific cases and see empty files and ask questions and get no answers and the kinds well, of things that uh, these family members have had to do? We decided as the three ministers that we would go coast to coast to coast and, and hear from families first. We've heard from over 2,000. We've had over 4,000 um, um, pieces of advice online as to how we have to design an inquiry that will actually get to the concrete actions that will stop this. So we've heard the stories. We've heard stories even of people coming here to the United States to be able to find a loved one who's missing or murdered here. Uh, um, the one that's 30 years old probably. Somebody was called a suicide, but she was shot in the back of the head. Uh, this is, you know, these are stories that you, you nobody's making this up. Um, this, is, this is real for these families. And there was a, you know, a, again, I think some of the stories that touch people is that everybody here who has a teenage daughter that where your teenage daughter's just called a runaway except she and her friend had left their cell phone and their purse on the table well no no teenage kid runs away and leaving their cell phone on their purse on the table so when you hear stories like this and you understand that that even some of the families were judging whether they should admit that they're indigenous because they think that the quality of the search or the quality of the investigation will be lessened. Tell, if me an the person instance, tell me an instance where in your conversations with families, they described that hesitation about admitting they were indigenous. Yeah, it, it, was, it was again that it comes out of a conversation we hear all the time that if a non-Indigenous person's missing, thousands of people are out in the fields, they're combing the woods, combing the fields, and when an Indigenous person is missing, it, they don't even get their calls returned. They say maybe, oh, they'll, she'll probably be back in three days, or that we, we actually hear that. But I think it was the first time where I actually heard a family member, and it was during one of the hearings in, uh, in British Columbia, I believe, that said, um, we and our family had a conversation um, because they lived in a city as to whether we would admit that, that their, their daughter, sister was an Indigenous person. At the time that uh, our women went missing, they, there was a garage uh, robber in the West End, which is very, you know, ritzy. 
Uh, they were going to put up a, re a reward to try to catch this robber, but they would not put up a reward for our women that were missing. And who told you that? Oh, I, do, I know that for a fact. I was oh, no, part I of it. I was know putting it. all how, the how did, you, um, how did you learn that? How did I learn that? It was in the papers. It was all yeah. over. Yeah. Um, uh, petitions. Did you ask for them to put a reward? We I mean, did. Petitions were signed. Uh, the attorney general at the time, he was willing up to put a mini reward up. So if the woman came and identified themselves as not missing, he would pay this mini reward to them when we were telling them that these women were gone and they, were, they wouldn't accept that. So, uh, Laurie, you're in the justice game, is that right? I was, I was. no you longer. Were, right. Um, describe your connection to, to all that's been talked about here. And, and I think most interesting to me is how, as a detective, you see details that make no sense, but when you fit them together, they produce exactly the picture that we've been talking about here. Well, I think that, you know, if you've been listening over the last day and a half, um, the common themes that we've heard in every single presentation certainly echo here. And I think that um, what, what resonates for me is that, uh, you know, in, in our particular investigation in Vancouver, where um, when I took on the investigation, we had 17 missing women uh, over a third of them were indigenous, um, but the, the, the overarching uh, thing that struck me was just the intersectionality of all the different um, factors that were coming into play. Uh, you know, we had classism right off the top, we had, we had sexism, we had racism, um, we had bias against um, women that were living in poverty, li working in the sex trade, in the survival sex trade. Uh, these were uh, all issues that, were, that, that I was faced with. And I, I, just to give you a bit of an idea of my background, I, I came to policing, uh, I had been a reporter, and I uh, joined the police department. And uh, I, right from that time, um, it was a very interesting kind of experience because in the police academy, uh, it's very, um, everything's very theoretical and they talk to you in ways that, you know, you're, everyone there is, has joined to help people. And, and, and I, was, I was certainly the same. And they tell you at that time in the, the academy, if you see things in the job that, that concern you, you know, talk to your sergeant, talk to people, come back to the academy, tell us, we'll help you. There's all this, um, this, this help that's presented. And I can tell you that the, in the, f the first day that I joined the police department and I, and I walked with my partner uh, on the beat in the downtown east side, and I watched him take a handcuff hook and ream out the mouth of a, of a drug dealer um, with, the, with the sharp end of that hook looking for drugs that weren't there. And I knew in that instant, A, I knew it was wrong and I was horrified, and B, I knew I was so already in that first day overwhelmed by that police culture that I knew that it was unsafe for me to speak out about that. And that is the experience of the police culture that permeates all of these investigations. And so what you have is a very dominant culture, and you have well-meaning, you know, the police are always recruiting. They're recruiting visible minorities, recruiting women. They want people, uh, you know, they want you to join that family. And then as soon as you do join, you are over, you are completely submerged by that culture, and you actually become that culture, and you can no longer um, I think, do the right thing. And for me, I, because I always felt like an embedded journalist in the police department, I felt like an imposter, I questioned that at every stage of the game, but I didn't have a voice. I only now have a voice because I'm no longer there and I've written a book, but before that, I couldn't. I couldn't speak out and it was incredibly frustrating because even when I tried to speak out, because my experience through this investigation was as a female, nobody was listening, and, and I had this frustration all the time of feeling like, basically in a nutshell for, for, for the audience, we knew quite early on who the suspect was in this, who became Canada's largest serial killer. Um, I had a tip the second day on the job, and I could not get the resources and the people in place to actually arrest this man 
or, or conduct an investigation in order to arrest him. And I think that that's the tragedy because there's that overarching attitude that these women don't matter, these investigations don't matter. We have all the investigative tools in the world in place, but there's nothing that tells an individual police officer, man, policeman, that you, this is important and you need to tell people this is important. We can call, we have a major case management model, but someone has to designate it a major case. And unfortunately, 17, 21, 31 missing women, mostly indigenous, was never considered a major case by anybody in charge. And so it was incredibly frustrating. And it ultimately, you know, that, it, it just... Well, we're going to talk more about those details because you mentioned his name uh, at the very, very beginning of, of our conversation. And before we get into the kind of uh, true crime details of this case, let's just think for a moment of how a set of conditions of persistent racism, as you describe, institutional passivity, and a, a lack of particular interest, law enforcement that has a culture that absolutely looks the other way, and a kind of knowledge on the street that there's a certain class of women who are throwaways. Who operates in a situation like that? Who, who, who finds that a, a, a fabulous environment to exist in? A predator. And that's what we have here. And is it too much of an exaggeration to say that you were assigned to essentially the largest crime scene in Canada's history? No, it's not. That's in fact what it was. But when I was assigned it, it was almost treated as a housekeeping issue. It was, we've got all these files we don't know what to do with. We've got all these women that aren't showing up at the end of the year and they're messing with our statistics. Figure out what's going on and, you know, try and have that wrapped up by the end of the year. And close these cases. Yeah, and well, not even close them, because to me, close them would mean finding the women. There was actually a point in this investigation that was reached where I was told, okay, that's it, we're done, we're wrapping it up. And I, <laughs> I said, did we find them? Because I, I haven't found them, and I don't know where they are. So that was, so it wasn't even treated as a potential serial killer investigation. Uh, it was treated as, um, a housekeeping issue. We need, to, we need to clean up these files. Can you tell me the story of when you learned about the DNA evidence? Yes. Uh, my daughter went missing in uh, 1997. Uh, so it was six years later when they um, came to inform me that they had found my DNA on the Picton farm. Um, so I didn't know where she was for six years. Yeah. And then. Uh, then the, it just went on and on. I went through the death, the inquiry, uh, the, the trial and inquiry. I fought hard for compensation for the children. And then in September of 2014, I get a call from the, uh, that the coroner wants to speak to me. And I thought, well, the coroner, why? I thought, well, they've made a mistake. It wasn't her. And uh, here it was farthest from the truth. Here they had found two pieces of my daughter's vertebrae that I was never told about, and they had been in a storage locker for four and a half years, and were returned to me after 12 years. And I just got my daughter's file in November, and I was told that Picton would never be charged with my daughter's murder, and Crown Council had wrote a letter to the contrary saying that if, he, if they went through with additional charges, that Robert Picton would have been charged with my daughter's murder. So I had no justice and not a lot of answers. You got any answers, Carolyn? Well, I think the serial killer piece is, is uh, not just Robert Picton. There was a the youngest ever serial killer in Prince George. Again, the same stories. They, it wasn't followed up in a way that um, that the families now know should have been. Um, but it, also we have to deal with the the policing and the, the quality of the investigation is one thing. But I think what I hear from the families is they want to stop this happening to other people. Mm -hmm. 
And so we actually have to understand that, that the, from colonization to residential schools to the child welfare system where we've got more kids in foster care now than at the height of residential schools. And they've been also taken from their language and their culture. And these kids don't do well um, in school and they end up in, in trouble. Uh, Describe the residential school system for people in uh, this country who don't understand what it, that's all about. At the same time as we were signing treaties on peace and friendship and, and, and embarking on confederation that was going to honor those treaties, uh, we were taking children and sending them to boarding school, um, which was in effect to take the Indian out of the child. This was in effect that the settler um, society thought they were better um, and the kids were not allowed to speak their language, practice their culture, and we are still paying for that now. And so while we, while we begin this process of reconciliation in Canada, we are also understanding that, that ripping children out of their families and putting them in non-Indigenous families where they're still being told they're, they're savages or they, they, their beliefs are not valued, um, that we also are subjecting them to child abuse, which was part of residential school where these kids were sexually abused and, and hurt, and then come out with problems with addiction and, and violence and, and later trouble with the law. So this is what we call in Canada um, intergenerational trauma. We see it also with some Holocaust survivors, that, that again, the intergenerational trauma of what happens when a generation is, has their language and culture taken away and has unspeakable things done to them or that they have seen that they're not allowed to talk about, that, that you see that in the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren. And so that is what our, our journey in Canada now is with the leadership of really courageous families that are, 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 are helping us. Um, because the 96% of non-Indigenous Canadians um, have no clue, really, about residential school. That when we say Canada's shame, that, you know, the, 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 the commissioner for the Truth and Reconciliation says, it, it is Canada's secret of shame. None of us learned any of this in school. None of us, none of us had a clue about residential schools or, or that, that the settler community um, sort of arrived. And, and one of our scholars, Mary Eberts, talks a lot about Victoria's secret, which is that the, the settlers had this very Victorian idea of women being seen and not heard, and they descended upon a culture where the women were in charge, where it was a matriarchal, matrilineal right. society, and, and we, we took all their power away. Take and, the Indian out and put runaway in. Yeah. And, and that's and so the exchange. It's what she calls creating a population of prey because you've taken the power from these women. And, and that's, that's the shame. And that's why we, we're committed to doing something about it. Melina? Well, I mean, the story even of my family, I'm the first generation out of residential school. The last, clo the last school closed in 1998. So that was when I was graduating from high school. So I mean, my dad was actually hidden from residential school and hidden from the Indian agent. And that meant my grandparents could have went to jail. So there was like these intergenerational impacts that it's really scary to understand how much it has an impact on our communities and how vulnerable it's made. And it's kind of torn apart the social fabric because when kids are taken from their communities for 18 years and come back as strangers to their own families, what kind of impact is that? It's, it's, it's massive and it's immense. And the violence that was inflicted upon those children from the age of three to five all the way through where you're, you're a savage, you can't speak your language, um, you can't practice your culture. You know, our system of um, the South African system of apartheid was based on how Canada was colonized and, the, and our imperial, the imperial and colonial policies that the government of Canada imposed on indigenous peoples was modeled in South Africa and the apartheid system. Great model, right? Unfortunately. It worked really well. Um, we don't have much more time, and uh, I want to give uh, a chance for each of you to say a couple more things before we, we go. Um, could you put that uh, photo back up of uh, Picton's work, mm -hmm. the poster of the missing women? God, I hate how 
anonymous those faces are. I, I just, you can't even see the names. It just, it, it just chills me to the bone to see how, how lost and vulnerable those people are, just even in those images. Um, is this likely to happen again? It's yeah. Still happening. It's still happening. It's still happening on yeah. a daily basis, yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a bit of a smugness uh, among the police that, um, uh, that they caught this particular uh, predator, they caught the one in Prince George, and uh, they, they think they've shored up all these uh, problems, but they haven't. And, the, and the, you know, the thing that really intersects here is you have the generational um, problem with residential schools and, and Canada's colonial and genocidal history, and then you have police investigations that are absolutely informed by and, and perpetuating a rape culture at the same time. So you have all, the, all these things coming together, devaluing women and creating, and creating police who continue to profile these women as being, as being not worthy of the same kind of investigations that, that many of us would, would warrant if we went missing. And that, that's what's got to change. And that's, that's so deeply systemic and, and everything seems so intersected to me that it's, it's difficult to imagine how it couldn't continue to happen. All of you are down in the trenches here in this, in different ways. Um, we think we're very clever in, in the United States when we say things like Black Lives Matter, which of course they do, and uh, that is a meaningful three words. Um, it's also the case that indigenous women matter in the United States because there's a problem of rape in uh, 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 Indian nations in, in America. Um, that we have to deal with. But just to say that these lives matter doesn't get us there. How far do we have to go, Melina? Oh, it's a big question because I think it's, it's the kind of Western pervasiveness of the mentality that we have, you know, the dominance of patriarchy, the dominance of imperialism. I think that's what really kind of goes into the communities all that all of us are from, you know, and that's how it affects all women of color, you know, and I think that that needs to be undone. And then I really hope part of the action of the inquiry will actually address, you know, police complicity and not just tell us that there's a problem, but how do we address this problem? And also a lot of healing from trauma needs to happen within communities, within all of our communities, because when we are living with trauma, we perpetuate trauma into other people, you know? And so for us, for the grief of my sister, say for instance, it continues every day. I wake up every morning at 4.50 a.m. at the time of her death and it's something I can't stop. It's trauma, it just continues. 4.50? Don't have to set the alarm. Tell me about the inquiry, Carolyn, before we go. We know that the stories matter, that, that we started with the families and they've led us on a good path um, to be able to make sure that, uh, that these stories of unfairness, I, you know, we think that the core Canadian value is fairness. No one can he hear these stories without without thinking there is an uneven application of justice and that it has to be fixed. And so we will, we hope to be able to launch the inquiry by, um, by the summer and it, it, will, it will have to deal with the issues around the child welfare system, around policing, and, but it is also about us getting to work on things like poverty and housing and, and Job welfare and the and the shelters and the things that we can do, but it's a matter of actually people understanding the real stories and the real people. We used to have a campaign called the you know the faceless doll campaign, like the poster that none of us like. Um, but now in Canada, people are starting to know these names. They know who these people are, and and all Canadians I think have been behind the need for an inquiry, but then the need for the prevention so that, that children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren can walk safely on the streets in their home communities or in our cities. Michelle, I'll give you the last word, but you know what makes me the angriest? Is that in hearing these details and in hearing the way you talk and that horrible story about the investigation, your daughter just didn't have a chance. No, she didn't. She didn't. And for a mom to have to live that. What can we do? I do what I do to raise awareness. Um, 
with the public with the inquiry coming, I, I, I hope it's a good thing. We had an inquiry in BC, and it was just a horrible, horrible scam. Uh, so I'm, I'm skeptical but hopeful. I raise awareness. Uh, if I can help save a life, then my daughter's death is not in vain. If I can help a mother from having to go what I went through, that's a good thing too. Please join me in congratulating and celebrating the bravery and intelligence of these four powerful women. Thank you.